Lesson 7 for February 6 to 12, Defeat of the Assyrians, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, February 6. And it's not often a Sabbath falls on my birthday. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you at the opening of this week as we're going to be studying some fascinating history from the book of Isaiah and from the Old Testament. And as we do so, we pray that we will not only just see your hand there for them, but for us as well in our individual lives. May we look to you for the help and the strength and the grace that we need in our relationships day by day. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 37 and verse 16. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Let's read that again. Isaiah 37, verse 16. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. A gaunt man walks barefoot with his two sons. Another family has loaded all their belongings onto an ox cart pulled by emaciated oxen. A man leads the oxen while two women sit on the cart. Less fortunate people have no cart, so they carry their possessions on their shoulders. Soldiers are everywhere, writes John Malcolm Russell in The Writing on the Wall, page 137 and 138. A battering ram smashes into the city gate. Archers on top of the ram shoot at defenders on the walls. Hectic carnage reigns supreme. Fast forward. A king sits grandly on his throne, receiving booty and captives. Some captives approach him with hands upraised, pleading for mercy. Others kneel or crouch. Descriptions of these scenes with the king begin with these words. Sennacherib, king of the world, king of Assyria. And continue with such expressions as sat in an Amedo throne and the booty of the city Lachish passed in review before him. End of quote. This series of pictures, which once adorned the walls of Sennacherib's palace without a rival, are now in the British Museum, and what a story they have to tell about the plight of God's professed people. Sunday, February 7. Strings Attached Question. What happened to Judah? 2 Kings 18 verse 13 reads, And in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And Second Chronicles 32 verse 1, After these deeds of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered Judah. He encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. And Isaiah 36 verse 1, our text for today. Now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. When faithless Ahaz died and his faithful son Hezekiah succeeded him, Hezekiah inherited a kingdom that had lost full independence. Having purchased Assyrian aid against the alliance of Syria and northern Israel, Judah was forced to continue paying protection money in the form of tribute to Assyria, as we read in Second Chronicles 28, 16-21. At the same time, King Ahaz sent to the kings of Assyria to help him. For again the Edomites had come, attacked Judah, and carried away captives. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the lowland and of the south of Judah, and had taken Beth Shemesh, Aedjalon, Gederoth, Sakoth, with its villages, 
Timna with its villages, and Gimzo with its villages. And they dwelt there. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he had encouraged moral decline in Judah and had been continually unfaithful to the Lord. Also Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came to him and distressed him and did not assist him. For Ahaz took part of the treasures from the house of the Lord, from the house of the king, and from the leaders, and he gave it to the king of Assyria, but he did not help him. When the Assyrian king Sargon too died on a distant battlefield and was succeeded by Sennacherib in 705 BC, Assyria appeared vulnerable. Evidence from Assyrian and biblical texts reveal that Hezekiah seized this opportunity to rebel, taking aggressive action as the ringleader of an anti-Assyrian revolt among the small nations in his region. As we read in 2 Kings 18 verse 7, The Lord was with him, he prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Unfortunately for him, Hezekiah had underestimated the resilience of Assyria's might. In 701 BC, when Sennacherib had subdued other parts of his empire, he lashed out against Syria-Palestine with devastating force and ravaged Judah. Question, how did Hezekiah prepare for a confrontation with Assyria? Second Chronicles 32 Beginning at verse 1, after these deeds of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered Judah. He encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that his purpose was to make war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his leaders and commanders to stop the water from the springs, which were outside the city, and they helped him. Thus many people gathered together who stopped all the springs and the brook that ran through the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? And he strengthened himself, built up all the wall that was broken, raised it up to the towers, and built another wall outside. Also he repaired the millow in the city of David, and made weapons and shields in abundance. Then he set military captains over the people, gathered them together to him in the open square of the city gate, and gave them encouragement, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib intended to take Jerusalem, the capital city, he made extensive preparations for a confrontation with Assyria. He strengthened his fortifications, further equipped and organised his army, and increased the security of Jerusalem's water supply. As we read in Second Kings 20.20, 20, Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might, and how he made a pool and a tunnel and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And that's Second Chronicles 32, verse 30. This same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet of Upper Gihon and brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. The remarkable Siloam water tunnel, commemorated by an inscription telling how it was constructed, almost certainly dates to Hezekiah's preparation for a potential siege. Just as important as military and organisational leadership, Hezekiah provided spiritual leadership as he sought to boost the morale of his people at this frightening time. As we read in Prophets and Kings, page 351, But the king of Judah had determined to do his part in preparing to resist the enemy, and, having accomplished all that human ingenuity and energy could do, he had assembled his forces and had exhorted them to be of good courage.
and so to finish the day. If Hezekiah trusted the Lord so much, why did he put forth so much effort on his own? Did his works negate his faith? See Philippians 2 verses 12 to 13 on cooperating with God who provides the power that is truly effective. Philippians 2 beginning at verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Monday, February 8. Propaganda. Our text for today is Isaiah 36, verses 2 to 20, but more about that later. The rulers of Assyria were not only brutal, but they also were intelligent. Their goal was wealth and power, not simply destruction. Let's look at Isaiah 10, verses 13 and 14. By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also I have removed the boundaries of the people, and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found like a nest the riches of the people, and as one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing, nor opened his mouth, with even a peep. Why use resources to take a city by force, if you can persuade its inhabitants to surrender? So, while he was engaged in the siege of Lachish, Sennacherib sent his Rabshakeh, a kind of high officer, to take Jerusalem by propaganda. Question, what arguments did the Rabshakeh use to intimidate Judah? First of all, we look at Isaiah 36, beginning at verse 2. Then the king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to him. Then the Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? I say you speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt on which, if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away, and said to Judah and Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar? Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master the king of Assyria, and I will give you two thousand horses, if you are able on your part to put riders on them. But then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's chariots, and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Have I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. So the Rabshakeh said, Has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words, and not to the men who sit on the wall, who will eat and drink their own waste with you? Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and said, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, 
Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be taken into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present and come out to me and every one of you eat from his own vine and every one from his own fig tree and every one of you drink the waters of his own cistern until i come and take you away to a land like your own land and a land of grain and new wine a land of bread and vineyards beware lest hezekiah persuade you saying the lord will deliver us has any one of the gods of the nations delivered its land from the hand of the king of assyria where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharaim? Indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their countries from my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? And Second Kings 18, verses 17 to 35. Then the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshakeh from Lachish with a great army against Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they had come up, they went and stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool, which was on the highway to the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph the recorder, came out to them. Then the Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? You speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. And in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Now look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, of which if a man leans it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master the king of Assyria, and I will give you two thousand horses, if you are able on your part to put riders on them. How then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Have I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, Shebna and Joah, said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words, and not to the men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste with you? Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and spoke, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you from his hand. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not l listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present, and come out to me, and every one of you eat from his own vine, and every one from his own fig tree, and every one of you drink the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive groves and honey, that you may live and not die. But do not listen to Hezekiah, lest he persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim and Hena and Ivor? Indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? 
who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their countries from my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand. And Second Chronicles chapter 32, verses 9 to 19. After this, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem, but he and all the forces with him laid siege against Lachish, to Hezekiah, king of Judah, and to all Judah, who were in Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, In what do you trust that you remain under siege in Jerusalem? Does not Hezekiah persuade you to give yourselves over to die by famine and by thirst, saying, The Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? Has not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars, and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying, You shall worship before one altar and burn incense on it? Do you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of other lands? Were the gods of the nations of those lands in any way able to deliver their lands out of my hand? Who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people from my hand that your God should be able to deliver you from my hand? Now, therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or persuade you like this, and do not believe him. For no god of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my fathers. How much less... Will God deliver you from my hand? Furthermore, his servants spoke against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. He also wrote letters to revile the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. Then they called out with a loud voice in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten them and trouble them that they might take the city. And they spoke against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, the work of men's hands. The Rabshakeh made some rather powerful arguments. You cannot trust Egypt to help you because she is weak and unreliable. You cannot depend on the Lord to help you because Hezekiah has offended him by removing his high places and altars throughout Judah, telling the people to worship at one altar in Jerusalem. In fact, the Lord is on Assyria's side and told Sennacherib to destroy Judah. You don't even have enough trained men to handle 2,000 horses. To avoid a siege in which you have nothing to eat and drink, give up now and you will be treated well. Hezekiah cannot save you, and because the gods of all the other countries conquered by Assyria have not saved them, you can be sure that your God will not save you either. Question. Was the Rabshakeh telling the truth? Because there was much truth in what he was saying, his arguments were persuasive. Backing him up were two unspoken arguments. First, he had just come from Lachish, only 30 miles away, where the Assyrians were showing what happened to a strongly fortified city that dared resist them. Second, he had a powerful contingent of the Assyrian army with him, as uh, we've already read in Isaiah 36 verse 2. Knowing the fate of armies and cities elsewhere, including Samaria, the capital of northern Israel, as we read in Second Kings 9 and 10, that had succumbed to Assyria, no Judahite would have reason to doubt that from a human point of view, Jerusalem was doomed. Second Kings 18, verses 9 and 10. Now it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years they took it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is, the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. 
And here we compare Isaiah chapter 10 verses 8 to 11, for he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kalno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? The Rabshakeh also was right in saying that Hezekiah had destroyed various places of sacrifice in order to centralise worship at the temple in Jerusalem. We read this in 2 Kings 18.4. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan, and Second Chronicles chapter thirty-one verse one. Now, when all this was finished, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah and broke the sacred pillars in pieces, cut down the wooden images, and threw down the high places and the altars from all Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh, until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned to their own cities, every man to his possession. But had this reform offended the Lord, who was the only hope his people had left? Would he and could he save them? It was up to God to answer this question. And so to finish the day, have you ever been in a similar situation where, from a human standpoint, all seemed lost? What was your only recourse? If willing, be prepared to share with your class that experience, how you coped, and the ultimate outcome. Tuesday, February 9, Shaken but not forsaken. Our text for today is Isaiah thirty-six twenty-one through to chapter 37, verse 20, but more about that later. Question. How did the clever oratory of the Rabshakeh affect Hezekiah and his officials? First of all, we look at Second Kings 18, verses 37 through to chapter 19 verse 4 Then Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn, and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. And so it was, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master the king of Assyria has sent to reproach the living God, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. And we're comparing this with Isaiah 36 verse 21 to chapter 37 verse 4. But they held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. And so it was, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent 
Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master the king of Assyria has sent to reproach the living God, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. Shaken to the core, and mourning in distress, Hezekiah turned to God, humbly seeking the intercession of Isaiah, the very prophet whose counsel his father had ignored. Question. How did God encourage Hezekiah? Isaiah 37, verses 5 to 7. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumour and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. The message was brief, but it was enough. God was on the side of his people. Isaiah predicted that Sennacherib would hear a rumour that would distract him from his attack on Judah. This was immediately fulfilled. Temporarily frustrated, but by no means giving up for long, Sennacherib sent Hezekiah a threatening message. Do not let your God, on whom you rely, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Have the gods of the nations delivered them? Isaiah 37, verses 10 and 12. And we'll also look at Second Chronicles, chapter 32, verse 17. He also wrote letters to revile the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. This time, Hezekiah went straight to the temple and spread the message out before the Lord of hosts, enthroned above the cherubim. Question. How did Hezekiah's prayer identify what was at stake in Jerusalem's crisis? Isaiah 37, verses 15 to 20. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. Sennacherib had pointedly attacked Hezekiah's strongest defence, faith in his God. Rather than buckling under, Hezekiah appealed to God to demonstrate who he is so that all the nations of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. Isaiah 37, verse 20. And so to finish the day, read prayerfully Hezekiah's prayer in Isaiah 37, 15 to 20, which we've just done. What aspects about God does he focus on? What principle do we see in this prayer that can give us encouragement and strength to stay faithful in our own personal crises.
Wednesday, February 10. The rest of the story. Our text for today is Isaiah 37:21 to 38, but we'll come to that a little later. According to Sennacherib, as reported in his annals, he took 46 fortified towns, besieged Jerusalem, and made Hezekiah the Jew a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage, wrote James B. Pritchard, editor of Ancient Near Eastern Texts Relating to the Old Testament, page 288. But, in spite of his penchant for propaganda as an extension of his monumental ego, neither in texts nor in pictures does he claim to have taken Jerusalem. From a human point of view, this omission is amazing, given the inexorable power of Sennacherib and the fact that Hezekiah led a revolt against him. Rebels against Assyria had short life expectancies and gruesome deaths. Scholars acknowledge that even if we did not have the biblical record, we would be compelled to admit that a miracle must have taken place. The fact that Sennacherib lined the walls of his palace without a rival, with reliefs that's carved pictures, vividly depicting his successful siege of Lachish, appears to be due to his need for a face-saving device. But for the grace of God, these pictures would have shown Jerusalem instead. Sennacherib did not tell the rest of the story, but the Bible does. Question, what is the rest of the story? Isaiah 37, verses 21 to 37. Then Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high against the Holy One of Israel? By your servants you have reproached the Lord and said, By the multitude of my chariots I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter its farthest height, to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk water, and with the soles of my feet I have dried up all the brooks of defence." Did you not hear long ago how I made it, from ancient times that I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps of ruins. Therefore their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and grain blighted before it is grown. But I know your dwelling place, your going out and your coming in, and your rage against me, because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears. Therefore I will put my hook in your nose, and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. This shall be a sign to you. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same." Also, in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards, and eat the fruit of them. And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward, and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it, by the same way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend the city to save it for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians one hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when people arose early in the morning, there were corpses, all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. 
Now it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nirshrok, his god, that his sons Adramelech and Sherezer struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Eashadon his son reigned in his place. In response to Hezekiah's prayer of total faith, God sent him a message of total assurance for Judah that boils over with molten fury against the proud Assyrian king who had dared to defy the divine king of kings, as we have just read in verse 23, which once again reads, Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high against the Holy One of Israel? Then God promptly fulfilled his promise to defend Jerusalem. And we find that in Second Kings chapter 19, verses 35 to 37. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians one hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses, all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained in Nineveh. Now it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the temple of Nisroch his god, that his sons Adramelech and Sherezer struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Esarhaddon his son reigned in his place. And Second Chronicles 32 verses 21 and 22. Then the Lord sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor, leader and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned shamefaced to his own land, and when he had gone into the temple of his God, some of his own offspring struck him down with the sword there. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them on every side. And Isaiah 37, verses 36 to 38 which we have just read, and it's the same as Second Chronicles 32, verses 21 and 22. A big crisis calls for a big miracle. And big it was. The body count was high, 185,000. So Sennacherib had no choice but to go home, where he met his own death. As we read in Isaiah 37, verses 7 to 38. Most of that we've read earlier, but let's just read from verse 7 for a few verses. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumour, and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Then the Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he heard that he had departed from Lachish. And the king heard concerning Tiraka, king of Ethiopia, who has come out to make war with you. So when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by utterly destroying them, and shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed, Gozan and Haran and Rezeph, and the people of Eden who were in Talisa? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Sepharaim, Hena and Ivah? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers, and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord, and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God. You alone are of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. 
Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. Then Isaiah the son of Amoz sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back whom you have reproached and blasphemed against whom you have raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high against the holy one of israel by your servants you have reproached the lord and said by the multitude of my chariots i have come up to the height of the mountains to the limits of lebanon i will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees i will enter its farthest heights to its fruitful forest I have dug and drunk water, and with the soles of my feet I have dried up all the brooks of defence. Did you not hear long ago how I made it from ancient times that I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass, that you should be for crushing and fortified cities into heaps of ruins. Therefore their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the grass of the housetops and grain blighted before it is grown. But I know your dwelling place, your going out and your coming in, and your rage against me, because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears. Therefore I will put my hook in your nose, and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. This shall be a sign to you, You shall eat this year such as grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same. Also in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, will do this. Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. And he shall not come into the city, says the Lord, for I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians one hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when people arose early in the morning, there were corpses, all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch his god, that his sons Adramelech and Sharazah struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Eoshadon his son reigned in his place. Ellen White writes in Prophets and Kings, page 361, The God of the Hebrews had prevailed over the proud Assyrian. The honour of Jehovah was vindicated in the eyes of the surrounding nations. In Jerusalem, the hearts of the people were filled with holy joy. End of quote. Also, if Sennacherib had conquered Jerusalem... He would have deported the population in such a way that Judah would have lost its identity as northern Israel did. From one perspective, then, there would have been no Jewish people to whom the Messiah could be born. Their story would have ended right there. But God kept hope alive. And so to finish the day, what do you say to someone who, not yet believing in the Bible or the God of the Bible, asks this question? Was it fair that these Assyrian soldiers, who just happened to be born where they were, should die en masse like this? How do you personally understand the Lord's actions here? Thursday, February 11, in sickness and in wealth. 
Our chapters today are Isaiah 38 and 39, but more about that later. The events of Isaiah 38 and 39 and 2 Kings 20 took place very close to the time God delivered Hezekiah from Sennacherib, even though the deliverance as depicted in Isaiah 37, which is also recorded in 2 Kings 19, had not yet occurred. Indeed, Isaiah 38, 5 and 6 and 2 Kings 20 verse 6 show that they still face the Assyrian threat as we read Isaiah 38 beginning at verse 5. Go and tell Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, surely I will add to your days fifteen years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And Second Kings 20 verse 6. And I will add to your days fifteen years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake, and for the sake of my servant David. In the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 4, page 240, we read... Satan was determined to bring about both the death of Hezekiah and the fall of Jerusalem, reasoning no doubt that if Hezekiah were out of the way, his efforts at reform would cease and the fall of Jerusalem could be the more readily accomplished. End of quote. So a question. What does the above quote tell us about how important good leadership is for God's people? And another question. What sign does the Lord give Hezekiah to confirm his faith? Second Kings 20, verses 8 to 10. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What is the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? Then Isaiah said, This is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees or backward ten degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is an easy thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. No, but let the shadow go backward ten degrees. And Isaiah 38, verses 6 to 8, I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow on the sundial, which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees on the dial by which it had gone down. By rejecting signs offered by God, as we read in Isaiah chapter 7, Ahaz had started the course of events that led to the trouble with Assyria. But now Hezekiah had asked for a sign in 2 Kings 20 verse 8. So God strengthened him to meet the crisis his father had brought upon Judah. Indeed, reversing the shadow on the sundial of Ahaz was possible only through a miracle. The Babylonians studied movements of heavenly bodies and recorded them accurately. Thus they would have noticed the sun's strange behaviour and wondered what it meant. The fact that King Merodach Baladan sent envoys at this time is no accident. The Babylonians had learned of the connection between Hezekiah's recovery and the miraculous sign. Now we know why God chose this particular sign, just as he later used the star of Bethlehem to bring wise men from the east. He used a solar shift to bring messengers from Babylon. This was a unique opportunity for them to learn about the true God. Merodach Baladan spent his entire career trying to win lasting independence from Assyria. He needed powerful allies, which explains his motivation for contacting Hezekiah. If the sun itself moved at Hezekiah's request, what could he do to Assyria? And so to finish the day, how did Hezekiah lose an incredible opportunity to glorify God and point the Babylonians to him? What was the result in Isaiah 39? Hezekiah, who should have been witnessing to them about the Lord, pointed instead to his 
own glory. What is the lesson for us? Let's read Isaiah chapter 39. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah was pleased with them and showed them the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, and all his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, They came to me from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house, and what your fathers have accumulated until this day, shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good, for he said, At least there will be peace and truth in my days. Friday, February 12. From Prophets and Kings, page 342, we read, Only by the direct interposition of God could the shadow of the sundial be made to turn back ten degrees. And this was to be the sign to Hezekiah that the Lord had heard his prayer. Accordingly, the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward, by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. And from the same book, page 344 and 345, the visit of these messengers from the ruler of a faraway land gave Hezekiah an opportunity to extol the living God. How easy it would have been for them to tell them of God, the upholder of all created things, through whose favour his own life had been spared when all other hope had fled. But... Pride and vanity took possession of Hezekiah's heart, and in self-exaltation he laid open to covetous eyes the treasures with which God had enriched his people. The king showed them the house of his precious things, the silver, and the gold, and the spices, and the precious ointment, and all the house of his armour, and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. Isaiah 39, verse 2. Not to glorify God did he do this, but to exalt himself in the eyes of the foreign princes. And that brings us to our two discussion questions this week. One, how is Satan like the Assyrian Rabshakeh? Does he tell the truth when he says that you have sinned? Zechariah 3 1. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. How does God respond in the following verses? 2 to 5. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. What is our only hope against these accusations? 
Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And question 2. Does Satan stop his accusations when we are forgiven? Revelation 12 verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. After you are forgiven, when Satan goes on saying that you belong to him because of your sin, what is the nature of his accusation? Deuteronomy 19 verses 16 to 21 If a false witness arises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days, and the judges shall make careful inquiry, and indeed if the witness is a false witness, who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and those who remain shall hear and fear, and hereafter they shall not again commit such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity, life shall be for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. The Law of a Lying Malicious Witness and to summarise this week's lesson. In response to the cry of a faithful king, God saved his people and showed who he is, the omnipotent king of Israel who controls the destiny of earth. Not only does he destroy those who attempt to destroy his people, but he also provides opportunities for others, no matter how Babylonian, to become his people. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Unexplainable Voice, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Pavloda, a city of 300,000 people in northern Kazakhstan, isn't particularly large, but Valentina Schlee couldn't seem to find the time to make the trip across town to deliver a gift from Germany. Valentina spent a lot of time caring for her three children. She also helped her husband make ends meet by selling homemade jam and pickles from a table on a city sidewalk. She felt badly that a gift received in a package from her cousin Nellie, who had migrated to Germany, was still in her house. Nellie had asked her to deliver the gift to her friend Olga. A month passed. One afternoon, Valentina was pausing to rest on a couch between house chores when she was startled to hear someone address her. Stand up, pick up the videotapes, and go to Olga, the voice said. The voice wasn't audible. It spoke from within her. Not sure what was happening, Valentina quickly got up, put on street clothes, picked up the gift, and headed off to Olga's apartment building. As she opened the front entry door to the apartment building, she noticed that a woman entered behind her. The stranger followed her up the stairs to Olga's apartment. When Olga opened her door, she welcomed both women into her home. Valentina wondered what was going on. Rosa, this is Valentina. Valentina, this is Rosa, Olga said, introducing the two women to each other. Then she turned to Rosa. You need to talk to Valentina, she said. Rosa began to weep. Through tears, she explained that she was facing numerous difficulties at home and had contemplated suicide. She also was seeking God, but she didn't understand what she was reading in the Bible. Valentina is a Christian, Olga said. She can help you. Valentina invited Rosa to attend Bible studies with her. Several months later, Rosa was baptised. 
Valentina said the experience underscored the importance of abiding in Christ as described in John 15, 7 and 8, where Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. When you have an abiding relationship with God, he can tell you where to go and whom to talk with, Valentina said. You can know his will. Part of the 2017 13 Sabbath offering helped open the first Seventh-day Adventist preschool in Valentina's hometown, Pavlodar, in Kazakhstan. And there's a lovely photo of Valentina sitting here, and I think it's inside her church. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.